Blog Talk Radio. Lord, you know I need you. King Jesus, you, you know that I, I need, need you every day of my life. Oh, I need you. King Jesus, oh, I know oh, you can make oh, every yeah, day of yeah. my life. Cause even when I'm down and out, down Lord, and out I, I can't wait. I, I can't wait. I can't wait. Shellcaster Network. The proclamation of the gospel of Jesus Christ by members of the Churches of Christ.
with your host, Stevie R. Butler. You're listening to the Gospel Light Radio Show. Thank you for tuning into the Gospel Light Radio Show. I'm your host this evening, Stevie R. Butler, from the state of North Carolina, with my co-host, Tim Bench, from the state of Texas, Glenn McMillian, from the state of Texas, Courtney Carruthers, from the state of Illinois, Steve Corder, from the state of Illinois, Dr. Frank Washington, from the state of Florida, Clay Phillips, from the state of Georgia, Brian Christian Coleman, from the state of New Jersey, and Robert Lee Johnson, from the state of Florida. Ladies and gentlemen, we are grateful that you're tuning into our radio broadcast this evening. This radio show is brought to you by loving and faithful members of the Churches of Christ. We would ask you to take out your Bibles and study along with us. We have a very exciting show planned for your spiritual enlightenment and your edification. If you'd like to contact us while we're on the air this evening, just give me a call to the live show at 713-955-0508. Or if you have any questions or comments for any of my co-hosts, you can send your questions to my new email address, butlersteve1009 at yahoo.com. Or you can give me a call at Stevie B Media Production Studio at 910-491-6405. Now, again, this program is brought to of the Churches of Christ. And if you need any assistance in locating a congregation in your area, please feel free to contact us. Now, folks. Get out your Bibles and stand along with us here on the Gospel Light Radio Show. You're listening to the Gospel Light Radio Show. Before we go into our program for this evening, I would ask that you would bow with me in a word of prayer that we may thank God for this opportunity. Our most kind, gracious, loving, heavenly Father, the Father, Lord, and Savior, Jesus Christ. Father, we thank you for this day. We thank you for allowing us to go through the various activities of the day and placing it on our hearts that we are on this broadcast and we are prepared now to present a portion of your holy and divine word. Father, we pray that you Tim Bitch and Clay Phillips on the show this evening as they break unto us the bread of life. We pray that you will bless their families that support their efforts, that they may continue to sow the seed of the kingdom. While we pray that you will be with our listeners who are tuning into this broadcast via Blog Talk Radio as well as through social media. We pray that they may listen well and that their hearts may be pricked and it will cause them to consider their eternal stance before you and their soul salvation. And it will cause them to ask the question, what must I do to be saved? Father, we thank you so much for sending your only begotten Son, Jesus Christ our Lord, to die such a cruel death on Calvary's cross. We recognize that without such a sacrifice, we will not have a hope of eternal life. Father, even now, we ask you to forgive us for the transgressions of our own heart. We know our flesh is weak, and we often fall short of your will. Father, we pray that you will continue to bless us and keep us and love us all the days of our lives. And if we have been faithful until death, Father, we pray that you will save us. For it's in Christ's name we do ask it all. Amen. You're listening to the Gospel Light Radio Show. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you for tuning into the broadcast this evening. Our speakers for the show this evening in the first segment will be my co-host, Tim Bench. He serves with the Oham Lane Church of Christ there in Abilene, Texas. He'll be making this proclamation of the Gospel of Christ. And we will not have a question in our second segment of the show tonight. 
due to an illness of one of my co-hosts. And in the last segment, my co-host, Clay Phillips, he serves as the evangelist for the Rose City Church of Christ there in Thomasville, Georgia. He'll be making his proclamation of the gospel of Christ to close out the show. So open up your Bibles and open your minds and let's have a great show. After the break, the next voice you hear be that of my co-host, Tim Bench. Enjoy the show. You're listening to the Gospel Light Radio Show. Listening to the Gospel Light Radio Show. Give your attention to the proclamation of the Gospel of Jesus Christ. Now, my co host Tim Bench and his subject, Pearls Before Swine. Good evening. As Stevie mentioned, my name is Tim Bench, and I'm calling in tonight from Abilene, Texas. And tonight, wherever you may be, we want to wish you a issue a warm welcome to all of our listeners from around the United States and also around the globe. We are certainly glad that you have uh, chosen to spend a few minutes with us tonight. And as always, we hope that the materials presented here will be scriptural, educational, and beneficial to everyone. I want to start with a scripture reading tonight. If you have your Bible handy, as Stevie mentioned, 
The title for tonight's presentation is Casting Pearls Before Swine. Our scripture for tonight will be from Matthew chapter 28, verses 18, 19, and 20. Jesus came and spake unto them, saying, All power is given unto me in heaven and in earth. Go ye therefore and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost, teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you, and lo, I am with you always, even unto the end of the world. Amen. Tonight, in our first segment, I'd like for us to briefly discuss and consider what is often the most difficult and problematic aspect of fulfilling the Great Commission. We are to go forth, and we are to teach all nations, and we are to take the light and the hope and the salvation that is Jesus Christ to a dark and vile and largely apathetic world. This is our task, and this is our duty as Christians. But in doing so, sometimes preachers, elders, and other concerned Christians spend actually too much time on those who do not appreciate the gospel. Even when someone rebuffs us or rebukes us or even openly mocks us, oftentimes we are hesitant to give up on someone that we believe to be a good prospect for the gospel. And there's a good reason for that. A soul, quite literally, is at stake. And whether that person accepts or rejects the gospel is a decision that will have massive ramifications into eternity. Simply stated, we don't want anyone to go to hell. And as Christians, we all do or should view that task with the utmost in reverence and awe. We have a a mind-boggling task, one that cannot be overstated in terms of importance. Jesus Christ gave specific guidelines on how to deal with rejection by those that we are attempting to evangelize. And if you go out and try to evangelize for any length of time, you will with certainty run into this. When our Lord went out, sent out the apostles on the commission, he said, this appears in Mark chapter 6, verse 11, whoever will not receive you nor hear you when you depart from there Shake off the dust under your feet as a testimony against them. These are the words of Jesus Christ himself. And in the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus said it even more bluntly. From Matthew chapter 7, verse 6, Do not give what is holy to the dogs, nor cast your pearls before swine, lest they trample them under their feet and turn and tear you into pieces. So for us today... In 2021, what does this pearls and swine reference even mean, and how does it apply to us today? First, I want us to consider some background on the verbiage here. The word pearls, in Greek, margarites, were usually regarded, this is from preceptaustin.org, regarded as precious stones in Jesus' day. Pearls are found in the Red Sea, the Persian Gulf, and the Indian Ocean and were brought into the Western culture through Alexander the Great's conquest. Pearls were prized beyond the purchasing power of the average person, and in order to obtain a pearl of great value, a merchant might have to sell all of his possessions, Matthew 13, verse 46. Dogs, Qon in the ancient world, does not refer to dogs as we currently think of them, for they were seldom household pets, but instead were largely half-wild, dirty, greedy, snarling, vicious, flea-bitten, diseased, mongrel scavengers that often ran in packs. They were often on the point of starvation and were known to devour even corpses and attack humans in the night. Clearly, literal dogs in the ancient world were both dangerous and despised. Swine are just as contemptible and filthy as dogs, The Old Testament mentions swine among the unclean animals, Leviticus 11.7 and Deuteronomy 14, verse 8. And the eating of swine flesh was an abomination, Isaiah 65.4, Isaiah 66, verse 3, and verse 17. Swine are not only unclean animals, but can be vicious and are capable of savage attacks against people, 
the wild boar of the wood was frequently met in the woody parts of Palestine, especially in Mount Tabor. In Psalm chapter 80, verse 13, the powers that destroyed the Jewish nation are compared to wild boars and wild beasts of the field, end quote. And if we do some research on the background of these words, from Strong's Concordance, entry number 3135, again the word margarites in Greek, meaning simply a pearl, while q which is entry number 2965 from Strong's, and this is an interesting definition, a dog universally despised in the East. So again, this is not man's best friend or our pet, as we often you know, might interpret the word dog today. Blue Letter Bible defines q as both a dog or also a, quote, metaphor, a man of impure mind, an imprudent man, end quote. And this is what we are going to be focusing on tonight. This is from Dogs and Hogs from the Bethany Church, quote, There are two Greek words translated dogs in the New Testament. One, cunerion, refers to a household pet, such as the little dogs that are permitted to eat the children's breadcrumbs that fall from the table in Matthew 15, verse 26. Kewan speaks of the kind of wild, mean, junkyard kind of dog that ran around in packs and growled when you even approached it. A dog of this kind was used as a metaphor for an utterly despicable person, Deuteronomy 23, verse 17 and 18, and 2 Kings 8, verse 3. Someone who is utterly reprobate. Revelation speaks of our heavenly home and says, Outside are dogs and sorcerers and sexually immoral and murderers and idolaters and whoever loves and practices a lie, Revelation 22, verse 15. This kind of dog was also used to describe those who were viciously opposed to God's call for holy living and who made themselves the enemy of God's people. The Psalms speak of them as if they were gathered together in hostile packs against the godly. Psalm 22, verse 16, The dogs have surrounded me. The congregation of the wicked has enclosed me. And Psalm 59, verse 6, at evening they return, they growl like a dog, and go all around the city. Even the Apostle Paul used this word to describe those who proved to be dangerous opponents to the ministry of the gospel. He told the Philippian believers, beware of dogs, beware of evil workers, and beware of the mutilation, Philippians chapter 3, verse 2, end quote. From James Burton Kaufman's commentaries on the Bible, in regard to Philippians chapter 3, quote, The status of dogs in that ancient culture was a far different thing from what it is in our own. The dog in America today is a loved and appreciated creature, but the dog was held to be most contemptible in ancient times. The Jews referred to Gentiles as dogs. The prophet Isaiah compared the false shepherds of Israel to dumb dogs, lazy dogs, greedy dogs, in Isaiah chapter 56, verses 9 through 11. And the psalmist designated the enemies of the Messiah, stating that the dogs have encompassed him, Psalms 22, verse 16, end quote. From William Barclay, quote, With us, the dog is a well-loved animal, but it was not so in the East in the time of Jesus. The dogs were the pariah dogs, roaming the streets, sometimes in packs, hunting amidst the garbage dumps and snapping and snarling at all who they met. J.B. Lightfoot speaks of the dogs which prowl about eastern cities without a home and without an owner, feeding on the refuse and filth of the streets, quarreling amongst themselves, and attacking passers-by. In the Bible, the dog always stands for that in which nothing can be lower. When Saul is speaking to take his life, David's demand is, after whom do you pursue? After a dead dog? After a flea? 1 Samuel 24, verse 14. In the parable of the rich man and Lazarus, part of the torture of Lazarus is that the street dogs annoy him by licking his sores in Luke 16, verse 21. In Deuteronomy, the law brings together the price of a dog and the hire of a whore, 
and declares that neither must be offered to God in Deuteronomy 23, verse 18. In Revelation, the word dog stands for those who are so impure that they are debarred from the holy city, Revelation 22, verse 15. That which is holy must never be given to dogs, Matthew chapter 7, verse 6. It's the same in Greek thought. The dog stands for everything that is shamelessly unclean. It was by this name that the Jews called the Gentiles. There's a rabbinic saying, the nations of the world are like dogs. So this is Paul's answer to the Jewish teachers. He says to them, in your proud self-righteousness, you call other men dogs, but it is you who are dogs, because you shamelessly pervert the gospel of Jesus Christ. He takes the very name the Jewish teachers would have applied to the impure and to the Gentiles and flings it back at themselves. A man must always have a care that he is not himself guilty of the sins which he accuses others, end quote. From James Burton Kaufman, again, quote, The most holy things ought not to be offered indiscriminately to all persons. In such a view, the dogs and swine would refer to mean and vicious persons who have no desire to apprehend spiritual things, end quote. That's exactly what we're going to be looking at tonight in some detail. And finally, from the critical commentary and explanatory on the whole Bible, quote, give that which is give not that which is holy unto the dogs refers to snavage or snarling haters of truth and righteousness. Neither cast ye your pearls before swine, the title of this presentation, meaning the impure or the coarse who are incapable of appreciating the priceless jewels of Christianity. In the East, dogs are wilder and more gregarious, and feeding on carrion and garbage are coarser and fiercer than the same animals in the West. Dogs and swine, besides being ceremonially unclean, were peculiarly repulsive to the Jews and indeed to the ancients generally. End quote. Simply stated this evening, there will be those, try as we might to open their eyes to the gospel, try as we might to introduce them to Jesus Christ, try as we might to save their souls, there are going to be people who simply and summarily are going to reject that message. And this can be a very difficult fact to accept. We often view ourselves as having failed when a person that we know rejects the gospel, and we may be torn up with feeling in regard to failure. We may often question ourselves with lingering doubts along the lines of, well, maybe I should continue with John just a little bit longer, or maybe if I try a little different approach, he or she might be receptive. Nothing can be more demoralizing or negative or even crushing to a Christian than to deal with someone who flatly denies the gospel and rejects its influence. And I think many in our listening audience can think back over their lives to people they may have personally known who rejected any overture made by anyone in regard to obeying the gospel of Jesus Christ. This is a citation from J.W. McGarvey in the Fourfold Gospel. Quote, The Christian must not be judicial, but he must be discriminatingly judicious. He must know dogs and swine when he sees them. He must not treat them as priests and kings, the fit objects for the bestowal of holy food and godly ornaments. Dogs and swine were unclean animals. The former were usually undomesticated and were often fierce. In the East, they are still the self-appointed scavengers of the street. The latter were undomesticated among the Jews, and hence are spoken of as wild and liable to attack men. Meats connected with the sacrificial service of the altar were holy. Even unclean men were not permitted to eat of them, much less unclean brutes. What was left after the priests and clean persons had eaten was to be burned with fire, Leviticus 6, 24 and 30. To give holy things to dogs was to profane them. We are hereby forbidden then to use any religious office, work, or ordinance in such a manner as to degrade or profane it. 
Saloons ought not to be opened with prayer, nor ought adulterous marriages to be performed by a man of God. To give pearls to swine is to press the claims of the gospel upon those who despise it until they persecute you for annoying them with it. When such men are known, they are to be avoided. Jesus acted on this principle in refusing to answer the Pharisees, and the apostles did the same thing in turning to the Gentiles when their Jewish hearers would begin to contradict and blaspheme, end quote. One additional citation, this is from Pearls and Pigs, quote, Do not persist in offering what is sacred or of value to those who have no appreciation for it, because your gift will not only become contaminated and be despised, your generous efforts could also be rebuffed and perhaps even openly attacked. The dogs and swine here stand for the unappreciative and the worldly unappreciative and uncaring men and women who belittle the value of what is offered to them. That which is holy would be the meat sacrificed, offered in sacrifice to God. A dog could care less whether it came from the altar or from the garbage. The swine have no appreciation for either the beauty nor the value of the pearls under their feet. Your time, your life, energy, opportunities, and abilities are God's pearls. They are his. You and I are merely his stewards overseeing his possessions. 1 Corinthians six nineteen through 20 and 1 Peter 4, 8 through 11. We must show discernment as to what use we make of God's possessions. It's possible to waste them either by using them when we should not as well as not using them when we should, end quote. I want to share a personal story because I'm as guilty of this as anyone has ever been. Twelve years ago, a former very good friend of mine for 20 years lost his job with a defense contractor in Fort Worth. And he moved to Abilene and he moved in with a girlfriend and he sank into full-blown alcoholism. His behaviors became more and more erratic and more and more bizarre and most especially more and more immoral. He drank from the time that he rose in the morning until late at night, and he would bemoan his lot in life the entire time. He was proudly and defiantly living in sin, and anyone who tried to talk to him or guide him out of his personal abyss was a, quote, Bible thumper and a hypocrite. I tried to assist Harland with delicacy. I would lightly discuss religious matters with him, and he seemed receptive enough. And we had several discussions, which I thought, wrongly as it turned out, might indicate some interest on his part. I was presenting a Wednesday night series at that time, and I casually invited him to come to this series, and he seemed receptive. Naturally, he didn't show up. So I tried again the next week, and again, Harlan did not show and a third and a fourth attempt provided no better or even different results, and the excuses, typically about how busy he had been or simply got tied up, flew like confetti. Ultimately, warrants were issued for his arrest in counties in and around Fort Worth for a litany of problems, for failure to pay his child support, for failure to appear in court, public intoxication, and so on. Harlan had no time for a job, and he had no time for Bible study. He had time for nothing but alcohol. Finally, and painfully enough, after many years of being friends, I metaphorically wiped the dust off my feet, and I ceased my efforts with him, which was difficult for me. Harlan could not and would not even provide for his own daughter, but he certainly had the resources to acquire beer. He certainly had the resources to acquire alcohol. Nothing else mattered to him except his own insatiable desire for alcohol. Harlan died two weeks ago from acute liver failure. His funeral was five days ago, and until the bitter end of his life, alcohol was the only thing that mattered to him, not church, not God, 
not his job, not his failed opportunities, not his wife, not even his own small daughter. 1 Timothy chapter 5, verse 8, But if any provide not for his own, and especially for those in his own house, he hath denied the faith, and is worse than an infidel. The last that I heard from Harlan was through the girl here in Abilene who had finally thrown him out, who informed me that Harless, home, Harland, who was both homeless and in jail, in and out of the jail in Fort Worth for contempt of court, aggressive panhandling, non-payment of child support, was going to come get even with me. That was the term that was used. I'm the same one who had lent him money for gasoline. I'm the same one who had offered him shelter when he was homeless. I was the same one that tried to bring him into church. But in the end, he turned on everyone. Everyone was out to get him, and he was filled with rage and paranoia. And as painful as this is for me to say, Harlan was an infidel, as per the verse that I just shared. He was a dog, as per the Bible, in a very literal biblical sense. This was an alcoholic criminal and fugitive from the law who failed to provide for his own family. He failed to provide for his own child. I had wasted far too much time with Harlan, which was nothing but a fruitless exercise in futility, time that I could have spent, time that I could have spent with far more productive results with other people than with Harlan, which was simply wasted. This is from the La Vista Church of Christ in Omaha, Nebraska, and this perfectly applies to what I just shared. Quote, a person who does not want help will not appreciate help that is given even if it is needed. Proverbs 9, verses 7 and 8. To expend energy on such people is a waste of time. There must be some desire on the part of the person who wants aid or needs advice. It cannot be forced on an unwilling recipient. We can see this in Paul's life. He preached to everyone he could, but when his audience rejected his teaching, he merely moved on to hopefully more productive grounds. Acts chapter 13, verses 45 and 46 in Acts chapter 19, verse 9, end quote. So how can we tell when it's time to give up on someone and turn to other fields and turn to other people? It should be after we have taught and prayed and exercised all long-suffering. But remember that even the long-suffering of God has its limits. From 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 20, which sometime were disobedient, whence once the long suffering of God waited in the days of Noah while the ark was preparing, wherein few, that is, eight souls, were saved by water. We need to realize that despite our best efforts and despite our best intentions, there will be people who perish, according to Second Thessalonians chapter two, verse ten, because they did not receive the love of the truth that they might be saved. Some people simply prefer their own way to the Lord's way. We read of that in Matthew 15, verses 8 through 15. Other people will simply close their eyes to the truth, Matthew 13, verse 15. And some Christians, according to Hebrews chapter 6, verse 6, will fall away and it will be impossible for us to renew them again to repentance since they crucify again for themselves the Son of God and put to an open shame. This is from Wayne Jackson with the Christian Courier. Quote, Christ was not attempting to discourage evangelism. The Great Commission clearly indicates that every creature needs to be exposed to the saving message of Jesus Christ, Mark 16, 15, so that he who will may come Revelation 22, verse 17. The text does not suggest that if one's teaching of the gospel is initially rejected, the teacher is to immediately turn away and quench all further evangelistic efforts. This was not the procedure pursued by the early teachers of the gospel. Potential converts may be confused, unlearned, inept, stunned, uncertain, or hurting, 
and patience must be exercised. But some responses are so vile, so brutal, so utterly reprehensible that one can fairly conclude that further time is an exercise in absolute futility. Apparently, that was Paul's experience in Antioch of Pisidia, when certain Jews they encountered were filled with jealousy, contradicted the things spoken by Paul, and blasphemed truth. Acts 13, verse 45, Acts 18, verse 6, Acts 19, verse 9, Philippians chapter 3, verse 2, and Titus chapter 3, verse 10. It is a sad reality, but not every person has that honest and good heart of which Christ spoke in his parable of the sower, Luke 8, verse 15. Some people are belligerent and totally unmoved by a biblical appeal or reasonable argument. They could not recognize a logical proposition if their life hung in the balance. They hate the Bible as no other book on earth, but they dearly do love to argue. They would rather dispute than eat. When one permits folks of this caliber to indulge his time, he is the loser. Occasionally, such characters may be of one's own family. Matthew chapter 10, verse 36. Just because one entertains a relationship with a parent or sibling does not suggest that he should waste his time with the former when there appears to be no hope of conversion or peace, end quote. Finally, from Casting Your Pearls Before Swine by Gary Young, quote, There comes a time when someone who has heard the gospel again and again and again has had his chance and blown it. No blame attaches to the preacher who turns from such a person, having expended all of his skill in attempting to portray the truth, only to have it spurned and even blasphemed. When someone to whom the gospel has been preached for a considerable time continuously rejects it and perhaps even engages the gospel preacher in extended discussions and disputations, even though he has no intention of ever changing his life, it is undoubtedly the case that he has gone well beyond his right to hear the gospel once or even a few times. Such a person is in fact wasting the time and the resources of the church and deflecting them from those who might perhaps be more receptive. It would indeed be tragic if a soul was lost because of time wasted in disputing with such a person, end quote. And that is exactly what I did with my friend Harland. The kingdom of God is precious. Our Lord compared it to a treasure hidden in a field and a pearl of great price. In Matthew chapter 13, verses 44, 45, and 46, the Jews in Antioch rejected the gospel and judged themselves unworthy of everlasting life. So Paul then turned to the Gentiles in Acts chapter 13, verse 47. In summary tonight, here is the sad and unavoidable fact of evangelism and one that each of us know from bitter experience, or, given enough time, we will learn firsthand. There are people who will accept the gospel, and they will listen with open ears and open hearts, and there are even more who will categorically reject the words of Jesus Christ. And often you, the mere messenger, will be the one targeted and mocked and lampooned and ridiculed and rejected. How can we possibly expect anything different when Paul and the apostles and Jesus Christ himself were likewise rejected by so many? Are we better somehow than they were? The vast majority of mankind will be lost for eternity. That appears in Matthew chapter 7, verse 14. And by definition, the majority of mankind will be consumed by apathy and false doctrines and outright rejection of God's message. The vast majority of the people that you attempt to take the gospel to are going to reject it, and they are going to reject you. And a Christian needs to prepare himself or herself for that often demoralizing fact. As Christians intent on taking the Bible to a lost world, we need to be constantly aware and conscious of our most precious and finite commodity, and that is time. 
are we spending our precious time in reaching the most possible hearers and listeners? Or are we bogging ourselves down with people who ultimately have zero interest in Jesus Christ, as I did with my friend Harland? Mindlessly wasting our time and efforts with only one may mean that we are missing out on bona fide opportunities to evangelize to five somewhere else or ten somewhere else. This is why we are told so clearly and in no uncertain terms to wipe the dust off of our feet and move on to persons who will actually listen to the message and that we are not to waste ourselves and our efforts in teaching what is holy, meaning the saving message of Jesus Christ, to the hardened of heart and the defiant and the rejecters of the Bible. Tonight, in closing, some questions for each of us to consider. Are you guilty of casting your pearls before swine? I certainly am, and I think all of us have been guilty at one point or another. Our task and our mission and our duty upon this earth during this brief moment that we have here is to lead others to this book, to the gospel, and its saving message. And the question is, are we doing that? Is the Great Commission your overriding concern in this life, or do other concerns, such as job worries or finances or family matters, other worries that we may deal with each and every day, have those pushed your Christian duty to the back burner, so to speak? This concludes my lesson for tonight. I certainly, again, appreciate all of our listeners, uh, wherever you may be located. We're so thankful that you chose chose to join us tonight, and we always hope and pray that these lessons will be biblically based and beneficial to all of our listeners. Thank you for joining us, and have a good evening. Is your congregation in need of lending for a building or expansion project? As your partner and advocate, Diversified Financial Network will take the time to understand your unique situation and develop a financing solution that meets your specific needs. It's an exciting time for your congregation, and what you need is a company with expertise in church financing early in the process. Call us today at 1-866-513-6665 or visit us at www.diversifiedfinancegroup.com. These are the events and announcements and activities in the Churches of Christ. If you would like to have your events and activities announced on this radio broadcast, Please contact me at Stevie B's Media Production Studio at 910-491-6405. Or send your emails to my new email address, butlersteve1009 at yahoo.com. On Thursday at 10 p.m. Eastern Standard Time, 9 p.m. Pacific Standard Time, and 7 p.m. Pacific Standard Time, there will be a nationwide outreach the nationwide gospel call at telephone number 1-857-216-6700 and the access code is 328-497 this is a nationwide outreach to those who are not members of the churches of Christ and the speakers will be presenting the basic salvation message for them to learn what they must do in order to be saved as well as information about the churches of Christ on Tuesday Evening at 6.30 p.m. Central Standard Time, the Delcrest Church of Christ in San Antonio, Texas, presents the Women's Virtual Bible Class, and this class will be held on www.zoom.com. Class ID number is 821-3692-8262. Daily at 6 a.m. Central Standard Time, the Ladies in Christ from Lafayette, Louisiana, has a prayer line, and this prayer line telephone number is 605-472-5203. My co-host Steve Cordell here on the Gospel Light Radio Show, he has a new book entitled God, Grace, and You, 
And you can purchase this new book at the 21st Century Christian Catalog. There will be a spring-summer series every fourth Wednesday of the month at 8 p.m. Eastern Standard Time, 7 Central Standard Time. The Preacher's Panel Discussion joined Minister Michael Crusoe as he moderates a series of discussions featuring seasoned preachers in the Brotherhood of the Churches of Christ. And the topic under discussion will be expanding the roles of women in Christian worship, a word from the Lord. On April the 26th, that'll be this Monday night at 7 p.m. On Zoom, there'll be a a national prayer revival sponsored by the Churches of Christ. And the theme is, through it all, we pray. And the password is prayer. And just a program reminder, this TV Media Production presents, we're airing live shows here on Blog Talk Radio. On Tuesday at 7, I'm sorry, at 6, from 6 to 8 p.m. Eastern Standard Time, 5 to 7 p.m. Central Standard Time, we'll have a guest speaker from the Brotherhood of the Churches of Christ each week who will be presenting a message from the Word of God. And we also have the Community Corner segment. That's segment designed for small business owners and entrepreneurs who have products and services that they're offering to our community. Also, I have three co-hosts on that show. Luke Gilbert, he's the evangelist for the Overbrook Park Church of Christ there in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. And my newest co-host, Shauna Otis, she's from the Greatway Church of Christ there in Nashville, Tennessee. She has the Big Tennessee Singles Ministry. And also, my co-host, Isa Mullins, he serves at Helen Street Church of Christ here in Fayetteville, North Carolina. Then on Thursday evening, each week from 6 to 8 p.m. Eastern Standard Time, 5 to 7 p.m. Central Standard Time, hosting the live show, the Gospel Light Radio Show. And that show has eight co-hosts who will be presenting messages from the Word of God. And each week I have two of my co-hosts on the air with me. I'm also taking a question from my Shout It Out platform on social media, Facebook, that I'll be posing to one of my co-hosts on this live show. Then on Friday night at our new time from 9 to 11 p.m. Eastern Standard Time, 8 to 10 p.m. Central Standard Time, I'll be hosting the live show, Stevie B's Acapella Gospel Music Blast Radio Show. And on this show, I'm playing some of the world's greatest acapella gospel music artists, the sweet sounds of voices. We also have the Story Glory segment where every first Friday of the month, I'm interviewing the artists that we're playing on this radio show. And on May the 7th, we'll be interviewing Gerald McCain. He's the director for the Church of Christ United Worship Chorale out of Atlanta, Georgia. And this Friday night, I'm counting down my top 20 acapella gospel songs for the month of April. My own demand episodes, if you can't catch any of these live shows, wherever you get your favorite podcast from, just type in your search bar, Stevie B, Media Production, and you'll see all of the shows that we're producing here during the week under this production. And some major musical platforms that I always like to announce, Spotify, Apple, iTunes, iHeartRadio, Apple, Amazon Music, and YouTube, just to name a few. I have a new sponsorship manager named Michelle Marco from Fort Lauderdale, Florida. If you'd like to be a sponsor for any of these radio shows, just give her a call, and she will be glad to assist you. Nine, her number is 954-687-4705. I'd like to give a shout-out to all of my sponsors. We certainly appreciate those who are sponsoring these radio shows. Sherwin Norwood from Chicago, Illinois, but there's the Memorial Friend of Director of Crematory Services of DeSoto, Texas, Stanley Phillips. Out of Little Rock, Arkansas, Cheryl Marab from Charlotte, North Carolina, Yvonne Blazing Cracker Gooch from Nashville, Tennessee, Melvin Jackson from High Point, North Carolina, and Marquise Holman from Charlotte, North Carolina, and Stephanie Booker Wilson from Greensboro, North Carolina, Diverse Financial Network LLC out of Dallas, Texas, on his market, Charlotte Carroll, and Ordain Faith Publishing out of Fort Lauderdale, Florida. The three E's of Stevie B's Media Production is the objective of this broadcast. We want to educate, we want to edify, we want to encourage you in the study of God's Word. And that will conclude our program announcement. Stay tuned for my next co-host coming up, Brother Clay Phillips, after this break. You're listening to the Gospel Light Radio Show.
riding down the road one day Just thinking about a good guy's being Oh, looking back at my life Well, and all that Jesus really means Oh, bring tears to my eyes He's working in my life His goodness I cannot repay Listening to the Gospel Light Radio Show. Give your attention to the proclamation of the Gospel of Jesus Christ. 
Now my co-host, Clay Phillips, and his sub with both hands. Good evening. Once again, God have been good to us. <clears throat> he have blessed us to be able to come and preach his unadulterated truth. I want to thank Tim Bench for the marvelous job that he have done on this evening. And I would like to call your attention to the seventh chapter of the book of Michael. And I want to read verse 2 and 3. <clears throat> That's Michael chapter 7, verses 2 and verse 3. And we find these words written. The good man is perished out of the earth. And there is none upright amongst men. They all lie in wait for blood. They hunt every man, his brother, with a net. Verse 3 says that they may do evil with both hands. Honestly, the prince asked it. And the judge asked it for a reward. Talking about bride. And the great men, he uttered mischievous desires. So they wrap it up. They accomplish their task. Thus is the reading of our scripture. And I want to call your Attention to a profound subject found in verse number three. They may do evil with both hands, honestly, with both hands. There is little excellent in understanding that. Michael, as one of the minor prophets, not that he's not valuable, but that he have a small book, very powerful. Uh, he deal with the dichotomy of that which is good and that which is evil. And here, we must understand when the text says, in verse 3, that they may do evil with both hands honestly. Now, what it's saying here is that the word honest comes from the Hebrew word here, successful. That they are successful. So he's given us an understanding that there are those that with both hands, commit evil, and not only do they commit evil, but they are successful in doing it. So we address this, this text, that no more, uh, the more, listen to me now, listen to this, the more honest a man is, in absolute totality, in other words, what are you saying, Brother Phillips? The more honest a man is in evil, the more dangerous he is. The more honest a man is in good, the more trustworthy that person is. So here, the dichotomy is the limit. When a person is evil, that individual have a absolute totality of committing the worst kind of sin. And the person that is uh, good have the propensity to do that which is good. Uh, the the in, infection of deep 
injury upon the individuals. When the Bible here, when Michael deal with the text, we must understand that the interest here is about truth. The truth of the matter is, there are people that are evil in this world. And they will commit heinous crime. And also there are people that are good in this world. And they will do that which is good. Now, uh, what the Bible is telling us, and Michael wants us to understand, what he wants us to understand here in the text, he wants us to understand that we must uh, have an interest in God just as the gangster. In other words, you compare the gangster with those that are uh, good, those that are trustworthy. So when he's telling his hero, he's telling his readers that God sees that there are those that are gangster-like, and they're doing the will of the gangster or the gangster boss. You remember when God called Abram, and he changed his name from Abram to Abraham, and Abram was living in a society that uh, was pagan, idolatry. And they was taking their babies, and they was offering sacrifice. And what God did, God called Abraham at an old age, said, you and your wife say we're going to have a child. And God tests Abraham faith. Now, the reason why Abraham became the father of the faith was because God did the gangster thing with Abraham. What do you mean, Brother Philip? God did the gangster thing with Abraham. Uh, God uh, noticed now that those idolatrous, those false gods and those false individuals that was worshiping false gods, they would go all out, gangster style, to serve their God that couldn't help them. So God called. Abram said, Abram, come to me. Now, I'm going to give you a child, but what I want to do is I want to see would you go all out gangster style for me. In other words, he's not telling him to be a gangster. In other words, he's telling him about the attitude of a gangster doing the boss will. Would you do what I asked you to do? So, Bible says that he had a son. You know, he had two sons. Ishmael, but then Isaac came, and God said, uh, now let me see, let me test you. Take him up to the mountain and kill him like the other God. The other guys are doing their sacrifices. They are sacrificing their kids to a God that cannot help them, but I am the God that can help. Let me see what you do, the gangster stuff, the gangster thing. And so Abraham went up, Abram went up and, and, and was going to sacrifice. But he knew in his heart that this is God. And the Bible says he, he pulled uh, the knife up and he killed Isaac. And the angel said, stay your hand. Woo. <laughs> stay your hand, boy. Don't you kill that boy. But I'm glad to know that you are dedicated, honestly, in other words, I can trust you to be successful. And so what is wrong with our society, our young men is trying to be gangster for the wrong reason. If you want to be gangster, be gangster for the law. And so it's not talking about uh, uh, derogatory. It's speaking of an attitude of I'm going to do what he asks me to do. And so when we look at the text in Michael chapter 7, it will. 
the wicked men here, notice what it says in verse number uh, notice in verse number two. It says the good man is perished out of the earth. Doesn't seem like that to you all. That the good man has perished off the earth. It's hard to find good men. And so he said, he's almost going to say that the good man is perished off the earth, and there is none of right amongst men. They all lie and wait for blood. Look at them. They're like a pike of hyenas. They hunt every man, his brother, with a net. They try to make sure you don't get away. Try to make sure you don't do God's will. Try to make sure you're not serving the Lord and doing that, which is right. And then that, that's why he said in verse number three, he says, he says that they that they may do evil with both hands honestly. They they they, they are successful in doing evil. And then he says he says the prince asketh. And the judge asketh for a reward, for a bribe. That is what happened in our society today. Everybody wants something for nothing. Or give me a bribe, and I'll do this. That is, that is what's going on in our society today. Everybody wants some kind of reward, even preachers. Because when you look at the text, when you look at the text, he's talking about the prophets. He's talking about the priest here. He's saying that the good, the great man, he uttered mysterious desires, so they wrap it up. In other words, they make a deal. They sign the contract. He said, I want you to understand what is happening here in the text with both hands, honestly, that evil men are being successful. But where is <laughs> Listen now, where is the good man? Where is the good man? Have they perished off the earth? There's a, a story I heard about a couple that lived in the mountains, and there were bears in the mountains, in Australia, and bears, and, and they had bears, and, and one day the bear kept coming in and bothered them with his house, his log cabin. And the story goes that uh, he took his shotgun, he took his gun and went out there and shot up in the air to run the bear off. And the bear ran off and he looked back and his wife had a hair brush standing there with a hair brush. And he cut it up and he puzzled and said, honey, honey, what you going to do with the hair brush? She said, I I'm, I'm, I don't have the hair brush to kill the bear. I have the hair brush for the bear to know whose side I'm on. Woo. I want the world to know whose side I'm on. I might not have much. I cannot do much. I may not be able to do what everybody else do, but I want the devil to know whose side I'm on. So here we find in the text, let us know that we must understand, if you will, we must let the world know whose side we're on by, because they are evil, and they're using both hands. The world is using both hands, if you will. You remember, you remember uh, the story that Jesus gave in Luke, turn the Bible to Luke chapter 18. I'm going to turn the Bible to Luke chapter 18. Give me an example here. In Luke chapter 18, and the verses number 1 through verse 8, here we find in Luke chapter 18 that here God uh, talk about the unjust judge. Now, understand, understand what is going on here, that God in and in Michael is telling us as children of God he said, I want you to have the same attitude that evil men have, but not the same deed. What do you mean? I want you to be good men that should assume in the work of God just 
as a gangster. Don't be a gangster, but a gangster have a code that they obey the voice of the boss. And here the Bible is telling us that we must learn to obey the boss of the, 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 the voice of the boss. So here Jesus gave a powerful illustration. He said in verse 1, chapter 18, verse 1, And he spake a parable unto them to this end, that men are always to pray and not to faint. So here we have the prerequisites to being successful, honestly. How you know? Because notice what it says here, and he spake a parable unto them to this end. So the first thing we must notice here is the means to an end. The, the reason why we do what we do because there is a mean to the end. And then it says that men are always to pray. And so here we find always to pray. And then the last prerequisite is it says, and not to faint. In other words, not to lose heart. So there are three prerequisites here that he's going to demonstrate that we as people of God, children of God, ought to have the honest desire to do the will of God just like a gangster. Even though this gangster is not saved, even though this gangster is not doing the will of God, but they have the totality of understanding, they understand that they have a boss that they have a bone that they have a bone I don't know what happened there but I'm going to keep preaching now notice now in verse number 2 of Luke chapter 18 and verse number 2 saying there was in a city a judge which feared not God, neither regarded man. It was a bad dude. It was a gangster boss. It was a gangster boss here. He was, uh, the Bible says he was a judge. And there was a widow in that city, and she came unto him, saying, Avenge me of my adversary. And he would not for a while. But afterward, he said within himself, though I fear not God, nor regard men or man, yet because this widow troubles me, I will avenge her, lest she continue the coming and weary me. So God is telling us as Christians, he said, Jesus is telling us, listen. You, you ought to have a means to an end. You ought to always to pray, and you ought to not faint. And then in verse number 6, it says, And the Lord said, Hear what the unjust judge said. And shall not God woo, avenge his own elect, which cried day and night unto him, Though he here bear them a long way off, I tell you that he will avenge them speedily. Nevertheless, when the Son of Man comes, shall he find faith on earth? Who will he find faith on earth? This kind of faith, let's go back to our text now. This kind of faith in Michael, where they that do evil with both hands. Woo. Look at them. They do evil with both hands. You got folks doing evil. And we, now, uh, let, me, let me give you the homiletics of my text, of my lesson, and then we're going to try to wrap this thing up sometime. The homiletics of the text. Write this down. The state in which many serve God. Let me give you the homiletics of the state in which many serve God. So I'm going to give you four homiletics how 
people serve God. Number one, without hands. <laughs> Number one, without hands. Number two, with one hand. With one hand. Number three, with both hands. With both hands. And number four, with honest hands. With honest hands. That is what I want to look at tonight to help us understand. So let us look now at without hands. Some good men, listen to me. Some good men, I've seen good men in churches that seems to be without hand. It, it seems like uh, you, you can't get them to do anything in the church. It could mean they come to Bible study and sit there and do nothing. They come to worship service, sit there and do nothing. Uh, when the yard meet morning, they don't show up. When things need to be done at the church. They don't show up. Why is it that it seems that it, good men have no hand? What is, what is wrong with us? They have hands, but they handle not. Ooh. I said they have hands, but they handle not. They don't do nothing. They have feet, but they walk not. They have eyes, but they see not. They have ears, but they hear not. They have mouth, but they say nothing. And so here we find that those that uh, work without hand, without hand, they, they work with, and notice now, notice now, they work with hand, if you will, when uh, it comes to other areas of the church or of the world. When it comes to other areas or other things of the world, they they have hands. Oh yeah. They can't they don't want to worship. They don't want to serve God. They don't want to do the communion or pick up the collection or do anything. Or they, they just want to stay home and they don't, and there are those that are watching me now that uh, hadn't seen the church for some time because oh the COVID Okay, and so here we find that they have, we're going to come down to uh, political arena. Y'all stay with me now. Don't get upset. <laughs> it's upset. I said, don't get upset. When it comes down to the political arena, they are Democrat, to Republican, and then, and they, they're all about politics and, and and don't understand that God is in control of everything. Ooh. When it comes out of social issues, they're all tied up in social issues. When it comes down to businesses, they're all, all in trying to get the American dream. But they are idle when it comes to Christian Christian work, they're idle. One of the uh, examples in the Bible I want to show you, turn to Judges, if you will, chapter 5. Everybody turn to the Bibles now, to Judges chapter 5. And I, I want to show you something here that is, that is uh, appalling, that, that, that should shake you, that should mess your mind up. Let, let, let me help you. Let me show it to you. Uh, Judges chapter 5 And the verse is number 23 <clears throat> Judges chapter 5 23 The Bible says Curse ye Mirah Say The angel of the Lord Curse ye bitterly The inhabitants There are Why God Say curse Mirah let me show it to you. Because they came not to help the Lord. 
to help the Lord against the mighty, against the devil. They did nothing. Why cut Mirah? Because Mirah, the city, did nothing. What had Mirah done to merit the curse? Nothing. They did nothing. And that's what's wrong with the our world today. That's what's wrong with the church. We're not doing nothing. Woo. What did they do? They did nothing. Now, let me say this here. Let me say this here. When God declared war, listen to me. Listen to me. When God declared war, God anticipates. Now, this is, this is, I'm going to show you what this text is telling us. It's telling us when God declares war, that he expects us, he anticipates us to do three things. Number one, to get involved. To not to sit behind the seat of do nothing. To get involved. And number two, to be a participant of the battle. Shoot up. Put on the whole armor of God. And then uh, he, he expects uh, to have a ready response. You remember Isaiah in Isaiah chapter 6 and verse 8 when the Bible says, God said, I, I heard the voice, Isaiah said, I heard the voice of the Lord saying, whom shall I send? <laughs> to whom shall I send? What do you mean, Brother Philip? You remember uh, Isaiah saw the vision. And the vision was he saw the angels, so the Lord coming with his, uh, his, his robe on and his cover and reached to the back of the door. And then there were angels that had uh, six wings to cover the eye and to cover the mouth and cover their feet. And, he, and Isaiah said, uh, I, I am undone. Who am I? What, what can I do? And the angel went and, with, and pulled a coal and put it in his mouth and cleaned his mouth. And, and then Isaiah said, now here am I. Send me. You remember the story. Send me. Here am I. Because who can I send? Isaiah said, send me, Lord. Now, let's look at Judges chapter 5 again. Let's wrap this up. Judges chapter 5. Now, why did God stay with me now? Why did God curse me so badly? And what is interesting, when you go back to verse 1 to verse 23, when you go back to verse 1, it talks about uh, God instituting this war, that Deborah and Barak know the war was about to begin. And the Bible says, then sang Deborah and Barak. Now, in other words, on that day, when the war got started, they sung. So what it's telling us is to do something. And the Bible said they sung why? Because they praised God. Notice in the verse number two, it says they praised God. And not only they praised God. The Bible says when the people willingly offered themselves, listen to me, the people offered themselves in verse number two. Then in verse four, it, it, it's amazing here. It's amazing. Listen. That in verse 4, it talks about the earth, the heaven, and the cloud. What? The earth, the heaven, and the cloud. It talks about the, the metaphor that the earth trembled. In other words, the earth helped God in the battle. What you mean by the, the earth helped God in the battle? When the, when the earth trembled, when the army was coming, stay with me now. When the army was coming and it, and it trembled, the heavens dropped darkness upon them. The clouds dropped rain on them in verse number four. In verse five, we talk about the mountain. The mountain melt when the army tried to run and hide. 
The mountain melt. Look at the mountain melt. Why? Because God called for a war. In verse number six, it talks about the highway. We're unoccupied. Unoccupied. Why? And and they couldn't travel on it because the highway just had potholes. It created its own potholes that they could not ride on. Pothole, look at them. And then not only that, in verse number nine, talk about the governor of Israel offered, if you will, the governor offered to help. So we got to help because God wants us to help. But right here, and then in verse fourteen. It talk about Zebulun, they that handle the pen. In other words, Zebulun says we can't do much, but what we can do, we can write. And the Bible teaches us that they took the notes. Woo! <laughs> Did something. Take your halfways and do whatever, whatever you got, whatever talent God gives you, use it in the battle. In verse 15, it said, Baal, right, was set on foot into the valley. He was commanded because Barak was the one that could ride. He had a chariot. He was good on the chariot, and he can do what, I mean, he can handle a chariot. But God said, I don't want you to do what you're good at. I want you to get down on your foot, and I want you to go down in the valley. Ooh. In the valley of shadow of death. I want you to go down there and check out everything. And then you got you got uh, Zeru, uh, Zerubbabel and, and you had uh, Zebulun rather and Naphtali. What did they do? The Bible teaches us that they was uh, they jeopardized their lives. They jeopardized their lives unto death. They were the most bold men. Look at them, bold, if you will. And then in verse number 19, the kings came and fought. Look at it. Verse 20, uh, the stars fell from heaven because they did no God. The stars fell. In verse 21, they talk about the rivers of Kishon swallowed up and, and kept the enemy at bay, if you will. <laughs> In verse, even in verse 22, I like verse 22 because the horse uh, hook passing and breaking the bones of the enemy. Even the horses done something. And then in verse 23, it says, Kershi Mira. Why? Because they came not to help the Lord. To the help of the Lord against the mighty. It was Jesus that said in Matthew chapter 12, and the verse is number 30. Matthew chapter 12, and the verse is 30. He said, He that is not with me is against me. He that gathereth not with me scattereth abroad. He wanted us to know that. You cannot say, I don't have any hands, right? God, I gave you ability. Whatever ability God has given you, use it. He, Jesus talked about, if you will. He talked about a man, he won five talents and gave one two talents. He gave one one talent. The one that had the five talents. The one that had the five talents, when he got five more. The one that had the two talents, when he got two more. But the one that had one talent, hit it and said, I know that you're a hard taskmaster. If you knew that, you should. If you know I'm gangster, <laughs> if you know I want you to be to me, more than you are to the world. Give me your all. Put God Almighty. And then they look at uh, with one hand. And all that was uh, 
with no hands. Now, with one hand, I got to hear up. It's kind of paraphrase. The next 10 minutes. With one hand. What do you mean by one hand? It means here that um, you're not finished yet. You're not finished. Turn, turn your Bibles to Second Peter. Uh, everybody turn the Bibles now. Uh, write this down. Second Peter chapter 1. Second Peter chapter 1. And I want to commence reading at verse number uh, 3. Second Peter chapter 1 verse number 3. According as his divine power have given unto us all things that pertain to life and godliness through the knowledge of him that have called us to glory and virtue. <laughs> In other words, God has given us what we need. You, you act like you got one hand and you want them. Uh, this is whereby are given unto us exceeding in great and precious promises that by these ye might be partakers of the divine nature, having escaped the corruption of this world through lust. Then it's turned off, notice in verse number five, it says, and beside this, giving all diligence. He says, you ought to give all diligence, be honest. Give me what you got. And beside this, giving all diligence, add to your faith. Now, the word add comes from the Greek word it means supply. Supply. God, I've already given you what you need. All you got to do is supply it. And to your faith, virtue, and to virtue, knowledge, and to knowledge, temperance, and to temperance, patience, and to patience, godliness, and these things, because God said, I have supplied those things. Uh, they're like the vaccine. America, the government, they have supplied vaccine for us to take. God is telling his people, I have provided the vaccine. Supplied you with woo, <laughs> the vaccine. What is the vaccine? Faith, virtue, knowledge. What, what is it mixed with? What is the ingredients? God and brotherly kindness and, and brotherly kindness charity. But if these things be in you and abound, they make you, ye shall neither be barren. You not, you go, what? God said, if you barren, it's on your own fault. Barren nor unfruitful in the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. But he that liketh these things is blind. You working with one hand. You acting like you are. God has supplied you with what you need. And cannot see afar off. And have forgotten that he was well, that, that he was purged from his old sin. Wherefore the rather brethren, in other words, the rather brethren, give diligence. In other words, remember what I told you. Give diligence. Work with both hands just like the evil people do. Don't, I, you're not telling us to be easy. Now. Don't, don't, don't misunderstand the message that God has given us. He's telling us, I want you to be just as dedicated to my will as a gangster boss, as a gangster is to his boss. Wherefore, the rabbi brethren, give diligence to make your calling and election sure, for if ye do these things, ye shall never fail. <laughs> Tell me, God, and good you are. So the apostles had to grow up. Amen. They had to grow up too. They, they were with Jesus, and they had one hand. Oh yes, all through the Bible, Peter said, 
Uh, Lord, I, I won't betray you. I'm not going to betray you. Peter, you, ain't, you don't have one hand, Peter. No, not me. No, not me. Okay, now, uh, you love me, Peter? Yes, sir, Lord. Feed my sheep. <laughs> you act like you don't have one hand, like you can't feed the sheep. Peter, do you love me? Yeah, Lord. Speak time. Peter, do you love me? In other words, you know I love you. Why are you asking me that? Because you're acting, and I know you have, you're working like you got one hand. What do you mean? That you hold, you hold on to the world. You hold on to the world, and you're trying to hold on to me. You got act like you got one hand. And the Bible says, Jesus said, I'll tell you what. Peter, the devil want to get you anyway. He want to sift you like wheat. He has to do, he want to sift you like wheat. i tell you what. The chicken is going to crow, and you're going to know what I'm talking about. The Bible says he went and warmed his hands to the fire. <laughs> Woo! Peter, you don't have on one hand. You, you followed me afar off, and you. And then someone said, You are with them. No, 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 no. No, I wasn't. Peter, you were with what, you, When you were with them? Somebody else came. I danced again. You were with them, Lord. And then the Bible says, Peter, use both hands, mentality. This is what Jesus was trying to get out of him. Peter used both hands to start cursing and swaying, and he was successful with both hands. What do you mean? They didn't bother him anymore. With both hands, honestly, he was successful to get out of the crowd because if he had gotten caught, they would have hung him as well on the cross. But he was successful evil. Then he went and cried. Why? Because he realized Jesus was right. With one hand, they were disciples, were working with hand. It takes time. The Bible says in Proverbs 22, 6, train up a child and where did you go when he's old? He will not depart. He had two hands, so to speak. And then, and then with both hands. Both hands are balance of activity. What do you mean by that, Brother Philip? <coughs> Excuse me. Both hands is the balance of act, Christian activity. A workman, a workman, needed not to be ashamed to write the Bible, <laughs> the word of truth. Why? Because he's using both hands. That's what Paul said in. In Second Timothy chapter four, around verse six and seven, he said uh, that I let me just read some of that. Good God Almighty, that's that's some good teaching. I don't, I don't want to just overlook that. In Second Timothy chapter four, verse number six, he says, "For I am now ready to be offered, and the time of my departure is at hand." Now he's going he's going to demonstrate to us. How both hands work. How he was sincere. He says, verse number seven, I have thought a good fight. I have finished my course. I have kept the faith. He's talking about with both hands. <clears throat> with both hands. Let's look a little further. Henceforth, there is laid up for me a crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, shall give me at that day, and not to me only, but unto all them that love his appearing. Because why? Because we've been working with both hands. We've been giving it all. We're not evil. We're not. We're not working the evil. We're not being uh, trying to take bribes. 
like the like the priest did in Michael seven. Know what it says here? No, no, what Paul tell us here? Know <clears throat> what it says? In verse number nine. This is the verse number nine. Do thy diligence, both hands, to come shortly unto me. He says, for demons have forsaken me. Then he's telling us about God's sovereignty. He's going to let us know that God worked in our behalf when we work with both hands, when we do all we can do. Having loved this present world. What was wrong with demons? Demons left me loving this present world. And it's a party under Thessalonica. Christians to Galatia taught us unto they too much. And then verse 11 says, Only Luke is with me. Take Mark and bring him with thee. For he is, notice what it says, now, for he is profitable to me for the ministry. Because you remember in Acts chapter 15, verse 36, he, 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 he said he can't go with me. See, Paul is telling us he worked with both hands. Sometimes he got off mouth. He got angry. He got frustrated like everybody else. He said, it's a wretched man that I am. And when you, when you work with both hands, you understand that you're going to make mistakes. But now he's saying, John Mark, now it's good and popular for me. He says, and Tychicus have I sent to Ephesus. And then he talked about four things. Here, yeah, I want you to remember my body. I, I need my clothes. Then I want you to remember my mind. I need my parchment. Parchment was the Old and New Testament scriptures that was completed. Then he talked about the spiritual side. Then, now notice what it says here. He, he talks about how people, he said, Alexander, the coppersmith did me much evil. The Lord rewarded him according to his work. Alexander used both hands to use evil against me, and, and then I had this. You worked my hand, but God said, stay your hand. I got this. And verse 17, says, nevertheless, the Lord stood with me. No, nobody else will. See, sometimes we use both hands. Nobody will stand with you, honestly. And strengthen is me. That by me, by me, the preaching might be fully known. And that all the Gentiles might hear. And I was delivered out of the mouth of the lion. <laughs> and the Lord shall deliver me. From every evil work and will preserve me, listen, preserve me unto his heavenly place, a kingdom with both hands. But what are you talking about? There are those that work with one hand, with no hand, they're not doing nothing. There are those that work with one hand that you, you have with there. No, you keep working. Those that use both hands. Uh, whether evil or good. He said, I want you to do good. And then he wants us to work just as hard as the evil person doing, trying to come and trying to be successful. Then he wants to work with uh, both hands honestly. In other words, that's what Paul was saying. Whatever I did, I did it honestly. I wasn't trying to. When I, when I was persecuting the church, I did it with both hands. But when I became a Christian and God saved me and brought me into his, I worked just as hard with both hands. You must hear the gospel. The gospel is the death of burial and the resurrection of Jesus Christ. You must believe, repent, confess, and be baptized. That will make you a new creature in Christ Jesus. I've said enough today with both hands. Honestly, work for the Lord. Work just as hard as you was working when you was in the streets. When you come to God, work just as hard in his kingdom. May God bless you. You're listening to the Gospel Light Radio Show. Will you forgive me? For I've done wrong. 
And will you accept me, Jesus? As I kneel at your throne, dear Lord, and all of my brothers, he will always criticize and accuse. Yes, he will, but I know that my Jesus, he will make me I'm ready at my oh, bidding, Lord. Lord, hear my prayer, please. Cause you're a God of a second chance. Yeah, yeah. I see them cry. Out. And they each have a stone. Dear Lord. But you knelt beside me, Jesus, and my fears are all gone. Praise God, cause you give me peace, surpassing the mind. And I know that in Jesus, sweet compassion, I'm all mine. Because in repentance, that's where you learn to turn. 
first round. And God gives you a second chance. You turn from selfishness. Turn towards godliness. You turn from anger. Turn toward joy. You turn from hatred. And turn towards love. My brother and my sister, God will give you a second chance. You're listening to the Gospel Light Radio Show. Ladies and gentlemen, I want to thank you for spending a little time with us this evening in a study of God's Word. I appreciate all those who've been following our radio show via Blog Talk Radio as well as through social media on Facebook Live. Our brother Clay was live on Facebook. So if you want to see that presentation, you can go to his Facebook page, Clay Phillips, and see that presentation. Also, uh, share it as uh presentation on my Facebook page as well. I want to thank my co-host Tim Bench for his lesson in Pearls Before Swine. That was a very uh, personal lesson for Tim, and I certainly appreciate his efforts on the show tonight. Also, my brother Clay Phillips always does a great job on this broadcast, and I certainly appreciate all the men who serve on this radio program week after week, bringing us lessons from the Word of God and just causing us to think about our soul salvation. Very important messages we've been hearing on this radio show. Ladies and gentlemen, we are just so thrilled to be able to bring you a weekly podcast, and it is our prayer that the lessons that were given on the show tonight have been beneficial to your spiritual lives and your relationship with the Lord has been strengthened because you're not only tuning into this radio show, but you've given yourself over to a study of God's Word. I'm your host, Stevie R. Butler, and I want to say on behalf of all of my co-hosts on the Gospel Light Radio Show, we really do appreciate your love and support for these radio programs. Good night, everybody. God bless you. You're listening to the Gospel Light Radio Show. It ain't easy. No. Sometimes it's hard down here, Lord. Sometimes it gets rough, so rough, so rough. Sometimes it gets tough for me. Has anybody been lonely all by yourself? Has anybody been sad, broken hearted and sad? Have you even been met? Oh, you had to cry all night long. I know it's hard, but what you need to do, you need to wait. Tired, so tired. 
You're listening to the Gospel Light Radio Show. You've been listening to the Gospel Light Radio Show, episode 227. My brethren, count it all joy when you fall into diverse temptations, knowing this, that the trying of your faith work in patience. It has to work out. God makes no one to God. 